gonna skip over that part, but um, <laughs> nice try. I <laughs> know it. Well, we're running a little late. No, I'm, I'm silly. <laughs> All right, so I will go ahead and introduce our inspirational speaker tonight, whom I'm sure most of you know, Reverend Mark Thomas. And I'm going to read a little bit to you about him. Some of this you may not all know. Mark was born and raised in Rockford, Illinois. Mark's early spiritual development came from his family, which was actively engaged in the Methodist Church. After graduating from the University of Illinois, Mark moved to New York State, where he took a job managing the Outdoor Education Center for SUNY Brockport. In 1982, after seven years in that position, Mark and Elaine were married, and he started his training and consulting work in the human services, I'm sorry, in the human resources field. Elaine and Mark began applying the accelerated learning to the teaching of spiritual development practices through their modeling course known as Spiritual Insight Training. In 1988, Along with Dr. and Mrs. Panabianco, Elaine and Mark founded Fellowships of the Spirit and its School of Spiritual Healing and Prophecy. Mark's interest in public service brought him to be elected to the Palm Frit Town Board in 1991, and he served as Chautauqua County's executive for two terms. In 2007, Mark returned to his original career as the director of the Western District of New York State Parks, retiring from public service in May of 2018. Over the years, Mark's passionate desire for spiritual development has brought him to study Vedic, Taoist, Buddhist, and mystical Christian teachings with a variety of teachers and writers from around the world. He currently lectures at various spiritual communities and continues to teach classes and advanced meditation practices in the School of Spiritual Healing and Prophecy and to its graduates. I give you Mark Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, and thank you all for being here this evening. It's quite a sharing and it's uh, the best business work in Jane, just like we hoped it would, yeah, as we, when we created this a year and a half ago. So it's wonderful. Thank you all for bringing your joys and concerns for us to all join in the sharing of burdens and joys, because that's the way things get lightened, you know. One of my favorite people of the last century, Fred Rogers, once said, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. And it's so true, you know, there's, there's ways that we can all be here for each other and this is what this service is about. So thank you all for coming and participating. Uh, to, and because this, this topic is uh, loving kindness and uh, the, um, the passage I, I'm working off of this evening is somewhat from uh, Jesus of Nazareth's uh, healing ministry, a couple of episodes. And I'd like to share those with you briefly and then I'll do my, my talk. They're from the, the Gospel according to Mark, 5th chapter, 22nd, 1st through the 43rd. And it starts out with uh, one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came out when he saw Jesus. He fell at his feet and began uh, begging him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went, and a large crowd followed him and pressed on him. Now on the way there, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And she had endured much under physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better. In fact, was growing worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She thought, if but I touch his clothing, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched me? Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see this crowd pressing in on you? How can you ask, Who touched me? 
He looked around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down in front of him and told him the truth. He said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from that leader's house. This first story kicking back in again. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble this teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue who was asking, Do not fear, only believe. And they left. And when they came to the man's house, he saw the commotion, people wailing and weeping, and he entered the house. And he said, why, why make such a commotion and weep? This child is not dead. She is sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who he was traveling with, and they went in to see the child. He took this little girl's hand and said, Talitha kumi in Aramaic, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was about 12 years of age. And at, at this very moment, they were all over, overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them, no one should know this. Don't be talking about this. And then he said, get her some food. <laughs> I thought, huh? We continue in that tradition around here all the time. We always got to eat, you know. So anyway, that's the story I wanted to, to talk with you about this evening. Uh, the two experiences of healing that took place because they're similar, but they're different in, in very significant ways. First, I want to talk about the backstory on each of these. Kind of like Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, you know? Because these are examples of loving kindness on the part of Jesus. And the first one uh, is uh, both of these situations where, where Jesus was engaged in healing, one way or the other, he was a player in them. The way this went about, he, it was punishable by death, not only for him, but for the other actors as well, under the laws of the day. First of all, a woman who is menstruating or a woman who's hemorrhaging, bleeding from the uterus, cannot be touched by any male or cannot touch any male. They're kind of, they are pushed aside, they're marginalized in the society. So if this woman for 12 years was in that condition, not just going through her period, but having a 12-year period of bleeding and was not getting help, she'd gone through all the resources she possibly could have and was in dire straits. Just her walking into a crowd of men and walking up to a rabbi of his status was, as I mentioned, punishable by death. The fact that she reached out and touched him without permission, touched his garment, again, that would have been hugely risky ac action on her part. The leader of the synagogue who came because his child was at the death door also was read in great risk because by this point Jesus was already under watchful eyes and ostracized by the powers that be already at this point because of the things he was doing. So this guy was running great risk, not only to himself, but even to his family. So the first thing, first part of this is both these healings are predicated by folks taking great risk to seek healing. One for herself, the other for her, his child. The second thing, the way Jesus responded in the, I'll take the first situation with the woman, was she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment and he sensed the power going from him. And he asked, who touched me? Who, who touched me? 
It's not just who touched me, but who touched me in that way. Because he could feel the power having the healing power coming through him go to this woman. And he, the, if you look at the, the Greek languaging in which the text is written, his tone was that of speaking to a loved one, not, I'm irritated somebody touched me. Okay, it was, hey, what, what's up here? And then he finishes that episode by calling her daughter. That's, an impo that's a very powerful moment in that story because he's saying, you're no longer a disinherited part of our population. You belong to me. You belong to us. You are part of our family. That's a, that alone is a very powerful and very controversial thing for him to do at that moment. He's going against all propriety in that situation, and he doesn't care. The official. You know, I think about when I've had friends who have children who are desperately ill, and what they go through, that they will do anything within their power, their capability, their opportunity to get that child help or a grandchild help, or a niece or a nephew, or dear friends. It's like people step up. There's always a soft spot in our hearts for taking care of kids and making sure they're going to be all right and they get a chance at life. And here you got a 12-year-old little girl that's on death's door. He's in desperation. He's in desperate straits. And he reaches out. In both of these situations, Jesus, any, oh, and here's the other thing. When he finally arrived at the house of this leader of the synagogue, he was told this girl, little girl, was dead. Rule number two, you don't touch dead bodies. Rabbis aren't to touch dead bodies. He comes in and says, takes her hand, touches her right away. Moves right in, touches her. Right away, that's punishable by death. He doesn't care. He's not going to let that stop him from being the power and the instrument of healing in that moment for this little girl and her family. Loving kindness demonstrated. Going from the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law rules with him in both of these situations. He's not going to let the formalities, the laws, the structures of the society in which he lives dictate whether or not he shows up to be there as a healer in that moment. That's profound when you think about it. And that's that whole backstory. The other thing I want to speak with you about tonight is that healing manifestations in these two stories, one, there's a passive healing, and the other is an active healing. And we often especially with those of us that are in the spiritualist traditions, get kind of caught up in, in the active laying on of hands and that sort of stuff. You know, it's all very, very important work that the active form of healing is about all it's focused on and taught. And yet there's this other aspect that's the passive form of healing. And it's not about doing nothing. It's about doing everything. Speak a little bit more about that. The woman took action on her faith, and she was recognized for it. He said, your faith has made you well. He said, I didn't make you well. God didn't make you well. Your faith made you well. Jesus took no outer action, but the woman's faith made for her wholeness to return. His presence alone was enough. He showed up, and the healing happened. That's a powerful thing when you think about that. And, you know, it's not just about him. It's about all of us, too, how we can show up for people in our lives, the people that cross our paths. And when we show up fully and in a moment of 
concern, care, just like you're sharing here this evening, we all do, and we do in our prayer life, all those things. When we show up in fullness of our own spirit, we are instruments of that healing, even though we don't have to reach out and touch. It's just the fact that we care, that we exhibit that by our presence. And it's considered passive in this light. Passive gets a bad rap in our culture, you know, like passive aggressive or passive resistance, you know, and it's like, no, there's great power in passivity. It's the word peace comes from, it's all connected in there. Coming from a, a form of deep inner peace, you are an instrument of the divine grace, of loving kindness. As you're an instrument of that. Just your presence shows up and communicates that, but also delivers that to other people. The second story, Jarius took action on his faith. He went out seeking the rabbi, the healer. He was in trouble. He, he had a problem, big problem in his family. His daughter was on, as we said, death's door. In this situation, Jesus took outer action. So it's an active healing that he stepped into a situation which was, you know, dicey. At best, if you've got a kid that's everybody's telling you is dead, and you go, nah, not going to happen. Not now, not on my watch. So in this case, he touches the girl, and he commands her to rise. She does. I get her some food. His touch was required, though. This is that active form of healing. It's kind of like what we do with laying on of hands. So in both of these situations, there's a different approach, but the outcome is dramatic and it's healing. And I think we need to open our eyes and our, and our awarenesses in our world today that what are our opportunities to be instruments of God's healing grace, of that loving kindness to bring transformation in and of itself, because it does. Yeah, your presence matters, your action matters too. And the fact that we can show up in people's lives, that amazing things can happen and do happen by how we show up. My cousin was here visiting recently and, and he had a teacher, a professor in college who had a definition for miracles that stayed with him all his life. I'd like to share it with you. What's a, what's a miracle anyway? He says, any event, natural or supernatural, in which the viewer sees the hand of God. I'll read that again. A miracle, any event, natural or supernatural, in which the viewer sees the hand of God. You see, it's all about the viewer and being open to the presence, the divine presence coming through and expressing. So therefore, it's on us too. We get to do that for ourselves. We get to do that for each other. We get to do that for the larger community, for the planet, as you mentioned, where there's desperate need. Desperate need. In this coming week, I invite you to be an instrument of miracles. Just, you have these incredible opportunities to be that light. And I invite you to, to find those moments, and when they cross your path, don't shy away. Step in. Show up. Let your presence be that kindness, that lovingness that can make that difference. And don't diminish it that it's only one person or one situation. You never know who those lives touch and those lives touch and those lives touch as their day goes on their week goes on and how much the seeds you planted are going to make the biggest difference in their day, in their week, in their life. So I want to encourage you to, to do that. And, and by the way, keep a little bit of it for yourself. Have a good